Fantastic. Well, good good morning and good afternoon to those of you around the world. Um, welcome to Reuters Events Oil and Gas's latest webinar, Integrated Campaign Solutions for Decommissioning. My name is Charlotte Howlett, the Head of Oil and Gas at Reuters Events, and I'll be kind of facilitating this webinar alongside our fine panellists and, and moderator on, on the session. Um, so, with joining us today, very much appreciated. Thank you all. Um, we have Keith Caulfield from Endeavour Management, who will be moderating the session. We have Bart Yoppe from Baker Hughes, Owen Plowman from Actonham Corporation, Will Rowley from Decom North Sea, and last but not least, Dave Sinclair from Total EMP Company. I want to kind of express my huge thanks to the panellists. It's a, a subject that um, I think we'll have a really great discussion on. So in terms of kind of a brief bit of housekeeping for the attendees, so we have an hour for today's session. Um, we will be having a combination of panel slides, discussion, and of course, audience questions and answers. So I really would encourage all of the audience to submit as many questions throughout the session. Um, we will try and get to them all at the end, but um, but of course, those those that we don't get to, if there's anyone kind of particular that has particularly burning questions, just let me know and um, and we can pass them on to the panelists after the session. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to Keith to properly introduce the, the webinar session. Thank you very much. Greetings, webinar attendees. We're very glad to have you. We hope to educate you in a mighty way today. We have a world-class panel, uh, and I'm very glad to have every single one of them uh, here. Uh, on behalf of Endeavor Management, we uh, are very interested in this particular subject and we play in this space. And so we're grateful for the opportunity uh, to be uh, moderating this panel. Uh, thanks to Reuters Events and to Charlotte. Uh, we're looking forward to a good webinar. Uh, Charlotte, you can go ahead and change, uh, do the slide. And you can go ahead and put it onto the uh, graphic slide for uh, to uh, to define what we're talking about today. We first need to look at how you might traditionally decommission a typical facility. On the slide in front of you, you see a blue line that that represents the flow of work. And uh, this is oversimplified, we know, but basically to uh, to decommission a typical facility in the traditional means, you would mobilize out to the, to the facility with a uh, vessel of choice, and you would mobilize specialized crews onto and off that facility to achieve the various tasks required to get it decommissioned. So as you can see, there's a linear flow between tasks one through four in the picture, and then you demobilize and your facility is gone and it's being mitigated uh, on the shore or wherever. If you need to um, decommission a different facility, in many cases, you'll have a different contractor at a different time, go out and do the same thing for the separate facility. Uh, slide please, uh, Charlotte. But in an integrated campaign, there are two major differences that gain you some uh, significant benefits. In an integrated campaign, the first thing you do is instead of going to a particular facility or maybe one or two, you bundle as many facilities as you possibly can or reasonably can into a campaign. Then to achieve decommissioning, you consider all the facilities as a uh, bundled uh, whole and you mobilize your first crew to start task number one, you send them out to the first facility and they do task number one at that facility and then move on to a next facility and they perform task number one over and over and over across all the facilities in the campaign until all the facilities have task one complete. Then you adjust your crew and your tooling, you start task number two, and you perform task number two over and over and over until it's completed across all of your facilities. You do that for all the tasks required and eventually you have decommissioned every single one of the facilities that are included in the campaign. 
Uh, next slide, please, Charlotte. Now, the comparison between that is pretty simple. Uh, the, the main difference is small number of facilities considered in the project with a linear, some would say vertical organization of how the tasks are achieved versus a, a reasonably large number of facilities considered uh, as a campaign. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what does this do for your, uh, what does this do for your company? I mean, what, what is really the benefit? Number one, it allows you to allocate your fixed costs over multiple locations. Um, the big deal here is that when you set a specialized crew to perform a task and you perform that task over and over and over, there is a steep learning curve involved. As they get better and better, when they do that task over and over, you start saving money, schedule, and safety gets better generally. You don't have to switch out your crew and your tooling. Uh, and possibly the biggest benefit, it can lower risk to your company dramatically. Decommissioning is full of uh, problems that are unforeseen that you run into only when you're out offshore. If you uh, perform an integrated campaign, if you run into one of those problems on a particular platform, you can move away from that problem platform, continue the work on the rest of the platforms while you buy yourself time to be able to fix your problem in non-critical time. That is very important. There are some issues here though, when you travel between platforms as much as it would take for an integrated campaign, you must uh, plan effectively to get between the platforms and not waste time. And we found that uh, the holy grail of this concept is that someday we would love to be able to do an integrated campaign with multiple operators involved. We have found so far, at least, that it is very difficult to achieve a cohesive contracting strategy to make that happen. It has proven to be difficult, and we'll probably discuss that soon. With all that said in mind, we've now uh, defined an integrated campaign for all of you. So let's uh, turn to our first panel question, and it's a very simple one. From your point of view, or from your company's point of view, what have you seen which are successes or achievements using the integrated campaign strategy and decommissioning? And we're gonna start with Bart Joppy. Hey, Keith, uh, Charlotte, uh, thank you for the introductions uh, and uh, for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Also welcome to the fellow uh, panelists, uh, Owen, Dave, and, uh, and Will, and all the uh, participants uh, today. Um, so I'm going to share with you two examples of uh, integrated campaigns uh, which have been beneficial. Uh, these are both examples for uh, well decommissioning, which <clears throat> quite often form the first step in the uh, overall decommissioning project. So the first project highlight is from uh, the Asia Pacific region, uh, where Baker Huge has participated in a multi-year P&A campaign performed from a jackup rig. Uh, the project uh, has a very repetitive scope of work and close collaboration with the operator and the rig contractor led to a continuously improving well abandonment efficiency throughout the campaign. Um, this resulted in the abandonment of uh, 1,473 wells on 117 different platforms. And this was accomplished in just 33 months uh, using two uh, assets retirement rigs. Uh, the operational efficiency was accomplished actually by increasing uh, the personnel on board. So we mobilized additional uh, bigger use personnel, equipment, um, and an offshore redress facility to really handle this very high volume of work scope uh, to keep the rig actively working at all times. Um, the project also included some combination trips um, with uh, our new purchase pump through Qatar and that was introduced to provide a single trip 
uh, to set a cement retainer, to pump the cement and cut the casing. And that really reduced uh, the time in, uh, from the operation about half. So that was really helpful to, um, to accomplish these uh, numbers you see here on the slide uh, in a fairly short time frame. Uh, to great satisfaction, of course, of, uh, of the operator. Um, the second project highlight, if you could move the slide, Charlotte, um, is actually from an onshore rickless integrated well abandonment uh, project in Europe. Uh, this operator uh, was looking for a low impact cost effective solution. Um, so Baker Huge, in collaboration with our partners, uh, we provided uh, and currently still provide a 100% electrical solution to reduce the emissions, uh, as well as noise and smell, as we are uh, working in a populated area close to, uh, to housing. Um, in the first year of operation, we plugged 20 wells. Uh, we did it on nine different well sites. Um, and the scope of work varied from simple to complex wells. Operations included a PCC, which is perforate circulate and cement, PWC, which is perforate wash and cement, and section milling, which count for some of the more complex uh, work scopes. Uh, and all of this was performed from a hydraulic workover unit. Um, project optimization was achieved through upfront planning, uh, a one team approach with aligned KPIs. We can talk about that later across all parties involved. So that includes the operators and any of the other partners on the well site. Um, operational improvements have been made by reducing the reckless move times. We move in about 48 hours from site to site and 24 hours from well to well and reduce tripping times by optimizing the multiple downhole applications I mentioned. Um, the project is currently ahead of schedule and both projects are still continuing today. Uh, over to you, Keith. Thank you. All right, uh, first of all, uh, I didn't uh, say this earlier, but we encourage questions. We don't uh, know if we'll be able to answer everything uh, during the event, but uh, please contact uh, Reuters events after the event if your question didn't get answered and it's important to you. Uh, but we encourage them. I'll try to answer what I can on the screen. Uh, Bart, you have one uh, uh, already. So if you can see that. Uh, our next speaker, Owen Plowman. Thanks, Keith. I, I echo Bart's uh, initial statements. Uh, it's great to be here and I appreciate um, the audience being here and the work that Reuters has put into making this happen. Um, I come at this um, issue from the perspective of a software company and uh, what my company does at Actinum, we develop operation scheduling and optimization software, which can be used in a lot of different areas besides decommissioning. But um, for the purposes of this um, session, I'm talking about our experience with decommissioning. So our software is designed to improve operations efficiency by improving the scheduling of resources and activities. And um, we, we always try to do that in an integrated manner across an entire project. Um, the software links the schedule to important key performance indicators. And I'm, I, if we have time, I might talk about that um, a little later. And we can optimize the schedule to align with business objectives. So um, if we, um, Charlotte, if you can click your mouse, the benefits we've seen from using our software is that we're able to really improve the efficient use of resources because we're looking holistically at an entire project and trying to minimize the white space in the non-productive time. Um, one of the points that Keith made when he was talking about uh, the, the con side of integrated uh, campaigns is that you really have to be careful how your resources are planned across multiple different individual components of the project. And that's something that we can certainly assist with. Um, what you find when you do that is that we align the resource use across those projects. And um, also, if we're working for a large organization with many different locations around the world in different um, geographic regions, we can align the whole planning and scheduling discipline across the organization so that there's a con consistent approach. Some of the results that have been achieved, we've seen a $30 million savings um, in one smaller project and 1,000 scheduler hours saved in one year. That came from 
the actual users of our software um, because it's um, it's much smarter than the usual project management tools that are used to schedule traditional campaigns. The other really important thing was that um, by adopting the integrated campaign strategy, we really increased the satisfaction of the internal audit group, which was very, very concerned that because there wasn't sufficient rigor in planning and because the methods used in different geographic locations to actually put the plans and schedules together was different. They had no confidence in the numbers that they were seeing for projections forward in time. So for example, they would look and say, how much are we gonna be spending 10 years in the future? And because everybody was doing things different and accounting for things differently, they said, we can't have confidence in these numbers. So when we put our tool in place, they were able to um, provide that consistent approach across different regions and um, achieve more success and certainly increase the satisfaction there. And this supplies that you can see on the last panel there, the clients we've got include independents, um, national one companies and super majors. So um, I think that really sums up what uh, kinds of results we've seen. I can't go into many more details because we're under confidentiality with all of our customers, but that's where we're seeing things going. Thank you, Owen. Uh, Dave Sinclair. Good uh, afternoon, good morning, everybody. And I'd uh, just like to echo everybody else's uh, thanks to Reuters, the organizers, and uh, Keith for uh, having us a, a chair here. So I guess the question to remind everybody was from our own company's perspective, um, how has integrated campaigns been beneficial? Um, Unfortunately, I have to answer that and say, well, I don't know, because we've never really been part of a fully integrated cross operator campaign. But the, the evidence that they are beneficial is there for everybody. And um, if we, we just glance back in recent history, perhaps at a slightly different discipline, we look at what we did in the North Sea with the BSV sharing campaigns, where nobody thought that would work. Then all of a sudden, a bunch of operators got together, shared a DSV, we all save costs, we did it safer, but more important, we actually achieve more work and the contractors actually got a better benefit from continuity of work because when people realized we could share, we could optimize, we could learn, that people put more and more work into the campaign. So it, it's kind of there. Um, and, and in total, previously, 2018, we looked at a, a multi-operator um, campaign with um, a couple of uh, other, other large majors, um, BP and Shell, uh, we looked at that, we, we assessed our decommissioning requirements against everybody else's, tried to put it together in a campaign uh, perspective, and, and we analysed we could probably sh save 25 to 30% of the costs, uh, not, not, not by um, pushing contractors' margins down, but just by working more effectively and more efficiently. Um, then, then we move on to, to 2019, and, and probably the best example we have in the industry of a, a multi-operator campaign that probably will happen. And that's the multi-operator campaign that is being um, facilitated by Next Step in the Netherlands, where we've got, uh, I think it's about an 80 well um, uh, subsea completions, um, or actually mudline suspensions, uh, with uh, owned by about six different operators, and I think it's total, we've got 13 wells in there. And that whole consortium have been working very hard for the last year and a half to try and put that together as an integrated campaign. And I think that's probably the first time the industry will see a cross-operator integrated well p &A campaign delivering what we all perceive it to, to be able to deliver. So... I think long, long story short, at the moment, a multi-operator integrated campaign is a concept a bit like the horizon. We all know it's there, but when we try and reach out and touch it, it, it moves away. And, and we need to, to, to actually make it happen because it, it's good for individual operators. It's good for our contracting community uh, and it's good for, for, for the industry. So uh, here's hoping. Uh, we'll rally. Yeah, thanks, Keith, and uh, I'll echo the, the sentiment. Good to be here. Uh, this particular subject I'm quite passionate about, um, having been involved in a couple of campaigns. Um, I just want to pick up on, on Dave's last point, that we can go back through history, uh, through our membership and even to the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere, 
there have been a whole series of areas where there have been campaigns. Um, and almost exclusively, uh, I say almost because I can't find one where it hasn't delivered any benefit, but the numbers are still small enough. We can count them on almost on our fingers and that's part of the challenge. Um, so they're all good, but we just can't repeat them. Uh, and I'll leave that as a hanging question, which I think we'll pick up on Keith as we go through. So I guess just to build on that a bit, Will, I, I mean, you, you know, and I know, we, we, we've all had individual campaigns that we've run and you've seen them from start to finish. By the time you finish it, you're 30% you're better than you were at the beginning. And you've got a team of people that are really experienced. They know all the tricks. They know all how to avoid the pitfalls. They know the techniques to use. Then all of a sudden, there's no more work for them to do. The, the, the team dissipates. They go to the four corners of the world. And then two years later, when you start again, you've got to start with a new team and and yeah everybody says yeah just read the lessons learned but that 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 in reality that doesn't work does it so yeah we, we've all seen the opportunities but how you join them up is the question definitely and we'll pick that up so back to you keith all righty thank you uh next question for the panel is uh, kind of on the other side of this question the other edge of the sword so to speak uh, what have been or will be the biggest challenges to integrated campaigns in the future? And uh, first speaker on this would be Dave Sinclair. So this is a, a difficult question to ask a, an operator because uh, I kind of know the answer to it, but uh, it's difficult. So in my experience, the largest stumbling block we have in multi-operator integrated campaigns is for all as operators to try and agree contractual terms and conditions uh, and the way to actually manage the work in between operators. And, and that, that should be fairly straightforward because with logic contracts, we get, we get BIMCO contracts, but it, it, it always becomes difficult. You, you, senior management see the opportunities they say yeah we should do it the people on the ground understand the benefits they want to do it but somehow in the middle of our companies when it gets stuck in our commercial and legal groups it, it becomes difficult to 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 coalesce on some contractual mechanism that works for everybody and i think a good example of that was we have previously tried to work with uh, a couple of companies that are, are are really trying hard to build campaigns just now. I think Wellsafe was one of them. And we worked a little with Wellsafe to try and help them come up with a, a contractual arrangement that probably would work well with different operators. And from something we started out, we thought it was a reasonably simple thing to achieve. It, it really was, it was a lot of work. And um, uh, it, it, it wasn't just as straightforward as we thought. And that wasn't actually... Um, Milling a case, and that wasn't pulling pouring cement. That that wasn't like undertaking technical well operations. That was just making a contract. Very interesting. Uh, Will Rally. Yeah, I'm I'm going to pick up on that point, Dave, and I'm just going to pull it down to to one word, which is behaviour. Um, it's. Uh, Often the irony is the technical challenge can be solved often in a matter of weeks. Uh, and everyone seems much more comfortable dealing with the technical challenges. Uh, but then as you say, aligning the commercial, contractual, and getting it th things over the line can take five, 10 times longer than the technical challenge. And yet often the campaign approach starts by being a technical challenge. Um, and it's that behavior and it's, as an industry, at some point, we're gonna to have to bite the bullet and change this behavior because we can't just keep um, be blunt, messing around with margins. We, um, we're gonna to start to lose capability. We're gonna to start to lose capacity in certain areas. If we don't get smarter and change the behaviors, these opportunities are just gonna disappear. Uh, and we'll just look back and go, we could have done that smarter we could have done that smarter. And we'll just keep repeating that, we could have done it smarter, but we won't actually change. Um, so it's the behavior that I really want to see change. And that's, that's the hardest part because companies by their very nature create a mechanism to, for people to behave a certain way. Uh, and so how you align that and, and force that change through is, is hard. I'm not undermining that. It is extremely hard. 
but at some point we're going to have to bite the bullet. All righty, Bart. Yeah, so, so obviously there's multiple challenges, right? We recognize, and I think uh, Dave and Will already mentioned a couple. Um, I think when, when you peel back that onion a little bit further, um, sometimes you also see some, some, some budgetary challenges. Is the budget actually large enough for a single operator to have a continuous campaign, or is it spread out over multiple years to fit in the budget? Um, we, I mean, Dave already mentioned the challenges when it is uh, across multiple operators. The, the other thing I think to mention is what is the scope of work? Because if we are uh, on the uh, shelf in the Gulf of Mexico, um, that work is vastly different maybe from what we see in the deep water. So even if you do have uh, the uh, scope of work and the budget as an operator, uh, the work might not be quite alike. And the best would be to group uh, like for like projects uh, to get those project efficiencies uh, worked out. Um, from a, um, I guess, a supplier uh, perspective, um, the, uh, the consequences of that, having a non-continuous scope of work um, does actually affect uh, the, the cost of the operation, right? With uh, multiple mobilization, demobilization, um, events, uh, that's suboptimal. It, it takes extra time, it takes extra cost. And, and the stop-start approach, as uh, Dave mentioned as well, will lead to some um, break in the uh, established learning curve, which, which again, is not as straightforward to pick up from paper. Um, and then last, I think, to, to mention is, uh, why is it challenging to, to, to get a campaign together um, if we are in, in, in an industry down cycle where cash flow is a constraint, we also see that some projects are pushed to the right. Um, I mean, it's it's a uh, it's not going to give you any productivity. So these projects um, do not affect your your production targets. So they're pushed to the right, and now they might actually drop out of a, a perceived um, collaboration schedule as, as budget has now also moved in the subsequent years. So I think there's, there's multiple challenges we need to recognize. Uh, I think all of those can be overcome, but that takes a lot of work collaboratively to, to, to come to that, that position that we all start um, in the same time frame uh, to collaborate. Uh, Owen. Yeah, um, a, a couple of comments. I think the... Um, the technical discipline is understood generally, um, notwithstanding the learning curve issue. The challenges, in my opinion, are more to do with the framework that's put around the entire process, particularly in an integrated campaign strategy world. Um, the, the requirements, I think there are four or five requirements for success. One of them is sustained leadership, involvement, and commitment. Um, uh, we've worked on a project, for example, where there was um, a very strong push to go to integrated strategy and to come up with a single global methodology. Um, so that project went along internally for quite some time, like a year, um, with a lot of planning and preparation. And then um, the organization went through a massive shakeup. The decision makers all changed. People came in, said, well, you know, I don't really see the value in this thing. And... Um, things sort of petered out so that you know the, the the need is there for some sort of real involvement and leadership on the part of management and commitment to make a change the second thing is i think from from our perspective at the software end there have to be agreed on key performance indicators that tell people whether they're being successful and that key performance data needs to be available to everybody and it needs to be rapidly uh, accessible and accurate at all times. So people know where they're going and whether they're achieving success because what you measure is the thing that gets improved. There needs to be um, a, a, a reasonable operating model in which to put the whole strategy of integrated campaigns. Um, we, we've seen a, adoption of um, the term by name but then we've seen some things that are very odd um, in a particular project we were working on. They, they decided that they wanted to do this integrated campaign strategy. So they had things like 
uh, a two week use of a bulldozer 10 years out in their schedule, which led to the whole thing being completely unwieldy because they had 250,000 activities that they were trying to monitor and track. And lots of them were just sort of placeholders way off in the distance. And yet they're actually trying to schedule the time that these resources are used, which is not a good approach at all, right? I think you, you, you plan for things on an execution basis in the short term, maybe the next six months to a year, but you don't worry about what's happening 10 years in the future and whether this thing is available at three o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. The last thing I think, which is a, an obstacle is that, um, I, I mean, I've been in this business for 40 something years in the software business, and I'm always interested in the things that make initiatives succeed and fail and what lessons can be learned. And the primary thing is an open attitude towards change and positioning for success on the part of the people. So saying that you're moving to an integrated model is fine, but there really have to be people who are behind that in the, in the lower part of the organization and committed to it. And everybody needs to be on the same page because if not, things will just go back either to the way they were or the initiative will peter out and will eventually fail. So, so I think it's really important to consider the change management aspect in, in the whole integrated um, decommissioning strategy. Back to you. Thanks, Owen. We appreciate that. We appreciate the, the answers for that question from all of you. Uh, the last general question for all of the panel is, what do you predict for the future regarding integrated campaign strategies? Uh, maybe if you have anything specific, uh, you might hit various regions of the world. Uh, not mandatory, but you might talk about that and the first speaker on that would be Owen. Um, I, I, I think of course it's always difficult to predict. I, I, um, I see that we're not just going to be worrying about um, the usual oil and gas facilities. We're going to have to start thinking about wind farm decommissioning. Some of the wind farms that are in place are now reaching the end of their life. Uh, lives and so the same kind of strategy needs to be followed through with decommissioning those kinds of platforms. Um, I, I do actually see that there's hope for adoption of a more rigorous integrated campaign strategy on a global basis uh, from talking to the different operators we work with. Um, there is definitely a push to do that and um, as a sort of complete aside uh, I don't have personal experience with this but I hear more and more the kind of thing that Dave was talking about earlier where multiple operators collaborate, I'm, I'm starting to see some inroads in that area. I think it's a, difficult, um, it's a difficult road to hoe in some sense because sometimes operators want to jump in and start collaborating and they haven't even figured out and got their own house in order. But there are technologies which might assist in actually putting um, a, a, a multi-operator campaign together. Um, for example, the use of blockchain to actually monitor contractual obligations and ensure that everybody pays for what they're supposed to be paying for and they're not piggybacking off of somebody else. So I think that more technology like that is coming which will assist. Again, I, I think the most important thing is going to be um, uh, sustained leadership commitment and involvement in the whole process. Will rally. Yeah, I'm a I'm an optimist. So I'm I'm optimistic we will see more integrated campaigns uh, across the world. Um, if I'm a realist, it will be nowhere near the number it could be. Uh, and unfortunately, most will not reach a conclusion, but I'm confident we will see an increase, but it will probably be with a small number of operators uh, and parties who have got themselves organized, not just to deliver the first project, but then to repeat it. And so we'll see the majority look at them and go, great, aren't they doing well? Uh, and we'll get some nice case studies and we'll see an improvement. And it, hopefully it'll be enough volume to to start to, to have an impact on the net cost impact in the industry. But I still think the majority will look from the sidelines looking in rather than get fully involved. Um, so an optimist will get more. Will it be enough? That's a slightly different question. Uh, Dave Sinclair. So future Maybe of... 
Yeah, well, I, I, I broadly agree, but thinking of the, the future of integrated campaigns, I, I have to say that if you, you look in the, the North Sea Basin, it, it's, it's got the biggest decommissioning obligation near term anywhere outside Gulf of Mexico, and Gulf of Mexico's kind of already there. Um, but if we look at uh, the North Sea Basin, the, there's a couple of examples where I think we can see things occurring. And, and as I previously mentioned, next step, the mudline suspensions, that probably will, will become a reality and it'll become a campaign. And then we, we'll, we'll get the results from that. And then hopefully we'll have a bunch of people who want to be fast followers um, who've been dragging their heels all the way along. Um, but the, hopefully that comes. The, 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 the second, or there's a couple of other examples where I, I, I hope we can do something. I, I know for, I think it's the last three or four years, the OGA have been trying really hard to, to get some campaign organised to deal with uh, the e &A wells that are scattered throughout uh, the North Sea Basin. They went new. UK sector even, I think there's over 200 um, exploration and appraisal wells that are sitting waiting for final abandonment and um, multi-operator ownership and the OGA knows about them but can't ever get the operators to get together, collaborate and go out there on a campaign basis. And I, and I know for, for years we've been talking about that, trying to make it happen. And, and it's just, you, you look at it and you look at the size of it, you look at the opportunities and you think to yourself, why can't we make that happen? And then your mind settles on the reason why you can't make it happen. And I happened to glance in one of the questions and answers in the, um, the, the, the website there. And it was somebody that said, well, why doesn't Total just leave everything to the end and then go out and campaign and do all its stuff at once? And that's obviously written by a trainee uh, chief financial officer because this is one of the biggest problems you get in decommissioning. As soon as people understand how to use the time value of money and depreciate things into the future, every chief financial operator says, we can't do that this year. Let's do it in five years' time. And um, nobody challenges that. They say, well, let's do it in 10 years' time then. And, and all the technical people go, ah, you can't do that. We're making this really tough for us. But by the time that the technical voice gets heard, it's too late. The financial decision has been made. So, so one of the biggest, uh, well, the biggest problems we have in decommissioning is people's use of time value of money to make a mountain of decommissioning that should be really worrying you into a tiny little molehill sometime in the future that you don't even talk about, let somebody else deal with that because I won't be here, I'll be somewhere else. Um, anyway, so that's probably one of the, 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 the kind of threats to decommissioning. But where else could we see um, campaigning happening? I, I think another initiative that's been pushed by the OGA, and, and I certainly hope to see something happening, is the whole East of Shetland initiative that includes our company, CNR, TACA, um, uh, et cetera, uh, loads of the East of Shetland large assets. If, if we can, as an industry, get together there and come up with some collaborative campaigns, we, we really have missed a trick. And, and that, that has to be a, a must-win battle for us in, 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 in campaigning. So I don't know if I've answered your question, Will, or have just talked too long and too much, but... Uh, <laughs> That's what I have to say for just now. Back to you, Keith. Uh, Bart. Yeah, I think to, uh, to continue what Dave just mentioned, right? I'm, uh, I'm an engineer by degree and uh, the technical, um, yeah, complexities of just postponing the, uh, the decommissioning project is, uh, is effectively gonna cost you more money uh, in the long run, right? There's a couple of examples uh, around the world where platforms become completely inaccessible. You can't put any equipment on the uh, platform anymore. And what used to be a rickless possible campaign now has to uh, have a rig and sometimes actually a rig, uh, which is especially developed. So you can hang above the platform rather than put any weight on it um, to access some of the wells as we see in some areas of the world. Um, I'm an optimist like Will, and uh, I do see a future for uh, integrated campaigns, both uh, within a single operator, uh, as well as across multiple operators. Um, I think success will drive uh, integration. If we have success stories where it works, uh, that same financial officer wants the most cost-effective solution uh, to all. And um, I think uh, that will drive a continuous effort to look into uh, integrated campaigns. 
I also think it's worth mentioning uh, collaboration, which is already happening across multiple operators. I mean, next up was mentioned, but it's probably also worth highlighting a piece, uh, the plug and abandonment collaboration environment. It's, it's technically focused. It's operators as well as service companies, as well as academia to look at technical um, uh, solutions to make uh, well abandonment uh, more cost effective. And I think it's technology innovation, mm -hmm. uh, collaboration, uh, which will drive uh, the future uh, in, in the decommissioning space uh, in, in on multiple levels. Adoption might be slow, as, as we've seen many times in the history of our industry. Uh, but if uh, it's more cost effective, there certainly will be an appetite for it. So back to you, Keith. All righty. Well, this is... Uh the, the end of one uh, part of the webinar, and now it's time for the audience. And uh, we, we have a, uh, this will be the question and answer period. We have a whole bunch of questions, probably far too many to answer that have already been submitted. Um, and I'll just try to cherry pick a few questions uh, for you all to answer. Uh, so let me get started in that. Uh, Let's see. And if you can keep your answers shorter, is if you can, uh, a panelist, that would be great. Uh, that will get us more questions in. From uh, Mark Bars, uh, he says, I'm curious how this will work for the SNS wells with the UK and Dutch legislations. And anybody who feels like they've got a decent answer, go ahead and jump in. So I, I, I uh, can't in, comment on, oh, carry on, sorry. Sorry, Dave. Um, it's not just about the legislation. You have to look at how the different operators and what their guidance is as well. Um, legislation is often the easier one to sort out. It's getting the individual operators um, aligned uh, with their own procedures and the people involved aligned. So you have to think slightly more widely than just legislation. That's often an easier one to, to deal with. Dave? So, so this, 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 you just reminded me of my, my, my favourite uh, um, event uh, that happened at a DCOM conference, I think a couple of years ago, where we actually had a break-off event on P&A. And uh, the break-off event was to discuss the regulations surrounding P&A. And uh, we all tricked into this room. The room was full, over full, because everybody wanted to discuss the regulations. And I can't remember who was the facilitator, but he was very good. He said, OK, everybody, what's the three regulations that govern p and And the room was silent because they thought there was hundreds of them. And he said, well, there's three regulations. One, you have to isolate the re re reservoir. Two, you have to isolate anything else that's above the reservoir from coming out the top. And, and three, you have to make sure you don't have anything at the top of the well that can interfere with any users of the sea. And that's the rules. So, so what else can we do? It's just these things. So legislation is usually not the, the, the thing that stops things. People have been paying p a wells for years and years and years. We all know how to do it. We know what the legislation is. It's just finding a way to campaign and do them effectively together. I agree. Is the I, uh, did uh, somebody else have anything on that one? Uh, you know, the biggest thing about legislation is relative to our subject of the day today. I don't know of any uh, regulation or legislation that would interfere with how you execute the project as long as you fulfill the three rules, like Dave just said. Uh, there are several questions uh, uh, among the group of questions that we've gotten regarding uh, decommissioning in remote or undeveloped areas. Uh, is there any uh, modification or change that we would do to an integrated campaign in, a, in an area where mobilization is enormous, I guess, <laughs> long distances? I could talk a little bit to that. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of challenges with that, right? And I don't think you can wholly avoid it. Um, you look at uh, the... Um, 
continuity of activity. And if there is no continuity of activity, it doesn't matter how close or how far it is, uh, mobilization and demobilization is going to eat into your cost uh, a bit more. If you talk about some more uh, remote areas, and, and we should not confuse remote areas uh, with, with, with just far away from, from where there is infrastructure, right? It is a remote area is also maybe nearby where they don't do this type of work very frequently. So um, for the well abandonment, if you need a light well intervention vessel and in your region of the world, there is no continuous presence of those vessels like you see in the Gulf of Mexico in Europe. Uh, they're a little bit harder to come by in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Asia maybe and, and West Coast of Africa. Uh, that would lead to additional mobilization time and cost. And, and the planning simply will take, uh, is a little bit more elaborate to get everything there at the right time. Um, and although I'm not an expert in that field, I know the same holds true for heavy lift vessels. Um, if you're on the uh, west coast uh, of the US in, uh, in California, uh, there is no continuous scope of work, which could lead to additional mobilization cost times and, and scheduling uh, challenges. Yeah, just to add to that, Keith, and you made the point at the very beginning around looking at these things vertically or horizontally. Um, there's quite a lot in most projects, even if it's a well p &A project, where you can look at areas related to construction and to other sectors where you can get savings. So yes, you may not be able to eliminate the mob and demob across the entire project and all the work scope, but if you start thinking a bit smarter about the different elements and break it down further, you can chip away at those costs and um, so you can minimize them. But again, you, it's the approach and the thought process uh, has to be done much earlier. Yeah, I guess, and also to build on that, um, decommissioning has, has one of its best friends in time. So for the big difference between decommissioning and development, de decommissioning P&A and development drilling is you're not driven by a first oil deadline. You get to choose when you do the work. So you can quite easily defer for a year. A year's not going to make any technical difference. And typically West Africa, you'll say to a contractor, right, you choose, you tell me the time you can do this work. When you're mobilizing the rig, you can pass the, the location. Um, you know, so you can wait a year, a couple of years to get the right time where the contractor's tools are closer to where you are. So, so time is your friend in decommissioning. You can choose when you do the work. The work doesn't choose when it has to be done because you're trying to achieve some from project economics. All righty. Uh, I have uh, several questions here. There's probably at least a dozen questions relative to the, qu to the issue of uh, multiple contractors uh, trying to cooperate doing integrated campaigns. I've been answering questions during the presentation, uh, but I certainly did get the impression that we've covered that area thoroughly. Is there anything else we need to say about multiple contractors, or should I just move on to a different question? I'll just have one quick comment, Keith, which is from my own experience, both in the current role, but also um, historically, contractors can usually find alignment pretty damn quick uh, amongst themselves when they see mutual benefit. Uh, so even when they're so-called competitors, uh, they often find it quite easy to actually work together um, and do it harmoniously. All right, and what about operators? Do we need to say anything more about cooperation between operators? I, I think it's a different beast to, to comment on that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a different beast to what Will described, and I, I completely agree with what Will said. Uh, our contractors can quite quickly find solutions that we as operators could never ever see. Okay. Uh, all righty. Uh, Owen, your company sells a scheduling tool with a built-in optimizer. What does that optimizer do to improve the execution of decommissioning? Um, the optimizer is used to take the set of resources and assign them to activities according to certain objectives. So those usually are aligned with the, the 
goals of the project and, and the targets you're trying to get to. So a certain budget spend or completion of things by a certain time. So um, what we actually enable you to do is run multiple scenarios for a schedule. In the traditional world, you sort of go along and take all your resources and assign them to activities. And when everything is assigned, you say, okay, hey, presto, here we go, we've got our schedule. Then you find that you've got um, a, a budget ceiling being exceeded or you're not achieving something by a particular date or you've got a mix up on your resources. So what our software does as the optimizer runs, it actually um, um, considers all the constraints in the model that you put together and um, aligns the set sense and aligns the set of um, activity resource sequences sensibly and it does that across multiple projects so you can actually see if you look at your whole campaign where there are opportunities to share resources and um, execute more effectively and it does that very rapidly so all righty um let's see um trying to get the best question here and I don't want to waste time. Here I am wasting time. <laughs> uh, let's see. Bart, your, uh, there were several questions about your slides. Your, those slides, those were land, land wells, mostly on, on your uh, presentation. Yeah, so I, I think I answered that one, uh, so I don't know if it's still visible. So the <coughs> campaign in Europe is onshore uh, p and using a hydraulic workover unit. Um, the uh, Asia-Pacific uh, high project highlight was all offshore uh, platforms. These are um, shallow water platforms where the work is uh, um, done to a jack-up uh, drilling rig. Um, and it does it quite effectively, is getting quite quickly from well to well. There's about 16 to 20 wells per platform there. So, and sometimes we're only on the platform for about a week to do a, uh, a fairly simple, but still quite comprehensive work scope uh, in, uh, in quick succession from well to well. Okay, uh, we've had several questions. I, we may have just answered this a couple of minutes ago, but I'll let you guys uh, speak to it. Uh, any impact on regulations in various parts of the world or lack thereof in various parts of the world on attempting integrated campaigns? I'll make a comment if I may. I'll, can I, I want to twist your question a little bit, Keith, because I want to talk about regulators rather than regulation. Um, I think, as Dave mentioned earlier, the regulation is really the problem. Um, and is, uh, in fact, Owen has, as well mentioned it, it's but the enforcement and the direction from the regulators uh, can be quite pivotal. Um, I'm not advocating we go to the degree of the Gulf of Mexico where there are set timelines because that can sometimes create a problem as much as it solves a problem. Uh, but it's the robustness of regulators uh, is one of the key ways you change some of the behavior um, and that's that's important. Um, I don't want this to sound like it's a uh, knocking operators because it is difficult. Uh, I would appreciate that, particularly when it comes to behaviours. But the biggest solve, biggest place to solve uh, challenges is with operators, and the only people who can influence them are regulators. Um, the supply chain can't influence them. Um, doesn't matter how clear we make the opportunity, uh, we have minimal impact. Um, so this is not operator bashing, but it's uh, the challenge is with the operators and the regulators can, can make change. Um, and a big shout out to the OGA in the UK who have been much more robust. Uh, and I think we're starting to get traction because of that. Um, there's still work to do, um, but it's, it's heading the right way. And to get that balance where the operators, it's not too easy for them to just push it backwards two years three three years five years ten years um and we got a supply chain that's got continuance of work and then we can start to change the behavior so regulators rather than regulation uh, i think is where we need to, uh, to push harder so i i would echo what will said it's uh, for sometimes when i i look across 
um, the uh, the contracting um, group we have, um, and and we look at the the impact that um, drops in our oil price has. It, it sometimes worries me that um, if we don't continue pushing work out to continue decommissioning in low oil price regimes, and um, some of the contractors, some of the investments, some of these companies have put in for years, probably will just evaporate and it will go. And then all of a sudden, we'll need these contractors sometime in the future, and they just won't be there because they, they we, we haven't, as an industry, sustained them. So there really is a balance to be achieved between uh, us operators with the decommissioning commitments we have to 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 undertake uh, and, and, and use of the supply chain whilst the supply chain is still strong enough and still still there to, to help us. So so there is a balance that we have to achieve. And I, I, I agree with, with Will that there's, there's some work we have to do there. I don't think MD wants regulation, but we, we, want, we want to be able to, to, to have a continuous stream of work that, that keeps our contractors at the top of their game so that we, we all benefit. Well, okay, uh, we are nearing the end of our hour and I'm gonna throw the panelists a curve, but since you guys are all world-class, I know you guys will handle it with aplomb. That is, if there's one or two simple points that you think are the most important things you would uh, want to communicate to the webinar attendees today about this subject, what would they be? Uh, you have about a minute and a half each. And you can, whoever can think of those the quickest, I'll let you go first. I'll go first. All right. <laughs> so oh, as a I'll facilities go. guy, right. as a facilities guy talking about well PA, the, the 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 best we could ever do for PA, whether it's individual PA programs or it's collaboration, is treat PA like a project, don't treat it like a drilling program. Okay, I'll jump in next. Um, the last year has shown us that change can happen pretty damn quick, uh, and sometimes it's forced on us. Um, I think there's quite a lot of lessons from the last year that we can bring into the whole sector and think about how we can change behavior uh, and make change going forward um, before it's too late. So we need to think about that urgency. Um, and just take the good part of the last year that we can enforce change. Um, uh, one thing I would say, I, I find it's very helpful often when you're communicating a message to provide a simple analogy. So my analogy for integrated campaign strategy would be um, building a house. Um, you would not build a house one room at a time. So you would not pour the foundation for the kitchen and then pour the foundation for the living room and then pour the foundation for um, a bedroom or bathroom and then worry about putting the entire kitchen together and then putting the living room together. You would, you would do it as a series of activities which are coordinated and integrated. And that's exactly what we're talking about in an integrated campaign strategy. Bring the resources in and allow them to go from room to room or from project to project and execute their activities. And I think that my experience is that making analogies like that lets people grasp rapidly what you're talking about. Whereas if you start talking about how you do that on a series of platforms, they, people may get lost in the details. Yeah, I think a couple of things, Keith. So I think as an industry, we need to continue collaborating. We do that in multiple forums. I mean, Beacom North Sea uh, represented here being one of them and, and pays what I mentioned. Um, and that is collaborating with the uh, regulator, uh, with the operators, with the supply chain. Uh, it is also focusing on technology innovation. And I think the best to ask for uh, as an industry is to have a continuous decommissioning, uh, well abandonment uh, activity uh, in a basin, because that actually will drive uh, the cost down more than anything as you have uh, lessons learned, which can be carried over from project to project. And that will help anyone out because uh, we didn't mention it, but, but multiple taxpayers in the world will pick up a piece of the, the pie here on paying for decommissioning costs. So I think that is, is something which we should all aim for 
and uh, and uh, and decommission efficiently, cost effective, and uh, which reduced impact for the environment. And we've gotten all four of you to answer that question, right? Very good. We are at the end of our hour. Thanks to our panelists. You guys were fabulous. Owen Plowen, Will Rowley, Dave Sinclair, and Bart, did I mispronounce your last name? I've heard many variations. Bart, your best fine. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all for the uh, extremely uh, beneficial technical uh, education we've received this morning. Thanks again to Reuters Events for putting this on. To all attendees, thank you for being here. To all the people who uh, sent in questions, we're sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but there are means to try to answer some of these after the fact. And uh, after uh, now that we're finished, I'd like to turn it back over to Charlotte if she's got a couple of things to say. Fantastic. No, Keith, thank you so much for, for moderating the sec session and to yeah, completely echo your comments to appreciating all of the, the panelists joining us here today. Um, we couldn't do these kind of sessions without the experts in the field. So yeah, very much appreciated everyone getting involved. And I hope the audience have um, have learned a lot. I certainly have. And I'm very, very pleased to have been able to, to host the session. Um, so to all of the attendees, we will certainly share the recording with you following the session. Um, and then as, as Keith mentioned, if there's any burning questions that you have, then do get in touch with me after the session and I can direct them to, to the relevant panelists way. But with that, with that, I will let everyone get on with their day. Um, but yeah, thank you very, very much to, to all of the panelists and to Keith. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>